What's up, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Real Me and Colon, a movie podcast where you didn't really ask for, but hey, we're going to give it to you anyways. This is a podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and, well, anything about movies. I'm one of your co-hosts, Chase Lee, and hey, guys, listen, if you, if you were searching on the internet for, you know, some, you know, recipes to to make for the Super Bowl tomorrow, and, you know, you, you, you typed in, like, nachos or something, and it brought you to this random movie podcast, and you're not a movie fan, you stumbled across it, and you, you're you like, oh, let me give these guys a shot, well, come in, come join the fun, because we're going to make you a movie fan and make you passionate, just like we are. If you are uh, a returning listener, welcome back once again, and if you are new, welcome again. What we typically do on the show is we'll go over some movie news and some movie trailers that have dropped throughout the week and commentate on them for you guys, and then we'll have a review of a movie that comes out during the week, and of course, the box office results for the weekend, but uh, today is Saturday, because uh, tomorrow is the Super Bowl, and uh, you know, Joel and I got stuff going on, so we're going to record on Saturday for you guys, and you guys get the episode a day early, uh, so with that being said, there will be no box office, but this is episode 216, and we're going to be going over Winchester as our main review. The one that uh, does not star Helen Mirren. She is a supporting role, uh, but she is advertised as so. And, of course, Jason Clark, and it is directed by the Spirit Brothers, which is funny because we – I feel like Jigsaw just came out last week, <laughs> but it came out in October, and it's just, you know, time is going fast. Um, so, yes, that is today's episode. But, uh, you know, before we begin, uh, i got to introduce the wonderful, beautiful co-host over there, uh, Mr. Joel. Uh, Joel, how are we doing this week? Well, thank thank you for finding me beautiful. I'm I'm very I'm very Joel, happy about you're, that. You're always beautiful to me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good. Uh, you know, it's been it's been a busy week. Uh, I can't really go into many details, but my parents have been involved in a, a, a pilot shoot for uh, a shoot for a pilot episode of something. I can't talk about it or where it's going to be or anything. We're, and and we're I will tell be. you guys right now because uh, you know Joel and I we tell each other stuff. And we keep everything confidential, but I can tell you right now. I'm not. I'm not trying to like hype it, but it's cool. It's really yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. So that that's been all week. They've been they've been gone. I I did go to one, you know, part a little part of the the shoot yesterday, um, and it was a lot of fun to see that uh, happen. So that was that was certainly an eventful thing. I was I stayed home mostly though. I, I didn't even have to work like any of the weekdays this past week, so I just kind of stayed home and chilled. Um, and, uh, watched, I finally watched the Wachowskis bound for the first time. That's amazing. If you haven't seen that, oh my gosh, the the fact that that's a debut is incredible. We do not deserve them. Uh, (laughs) I've actually never seen bound. Yeah, man. Oh man. It is just about great. And Jennifer Tilly, uh, is in the movie and was denied the opportunity to be nominated for best actress. And that is something for which I will forever be salty. Uh, that is, it's, it's a great, great, great movie, great performance. Uh, and I, everybody's great in the movie, but Jennifer Tilly in particular is like on another level. Uh, it's a, it's a great movie. I actually, um, I actually wanted to see bound after I saw sense eight. I'm just like, Oh, that seems like similar type of tones. And so I was, that actually made me yeah, want to go seek watch. out bound more. Yeah, I gotta watch Sense Eight. Uh, Sense Eight's I, amazing. I, yeah, I'm, I've been, I've pretty much loved everything, except maybe the Matrix Revolutions uh, <laughs> from them. And even the Matrix Revolutions has its moments. I, it, I, it, I it has moments, but it's yeah. a cohesive film. It does not work. the The whole second half doesn't work, but <laughs> the the first half does. I, I think that when it's when it's trying to set up the finale, it works. But the yeah. finale doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I bound. Or the Matrix might be my favorite of theirs, um, but I, I love Cloud Atlas. I love Speed Racer. Even uh, Jupiter Ascending is another one that I I don't I, I think back on it kind of fondly, but I don't remember liking it. It's not one I remember very well though. <laughs> so even though it's only three years old, uh, I mean I know that Channing Tatum's in it, and Mila Kunis, but I don't really know. Um, in any case, I do need to see Sense Eight because that's now the only blind spot. Uh, and that's a TV show. So I've seen all of their movies and it's, uh, it's pretty, it's, it's, they're great filmmakers. So I'm, yes, they, um, are. They, they have uh, real, like the thing was with sense eight is that it's such a great, like epic sci-fi drama and it's something they have never really tapped into before, like in that kind of genre or wheelhouse. And it's so just kind of beautiful and just how it's like, um, uh, 
shot and everything and how it's like kind of put together because it focuses on like eight different countries. It's an, it's an insanely epic show. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's it's really good. So please, every check everything that out. about it sounds like it's right down my alley. I just oh, you're, I just, you're gonna love it. I just didn't have time when it came out and it got away from me, but certainly I'm gonna I'm gonna pick pick up on that eventually. Otherwise, it's just been kind of a a nice relaxing week for me. So <laughs> yeah, uh, same with me. I mean, of course, uh, Joel and I saw a movie on um, Monday, right? Yeah, 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 Monday. And um, <clears throat> if you would like to see our reviews on that, please go check out our separate <laughs> accounts uh, on YouTube and his uh, website. But that was an interesting film. Um, I also checked out because I'm a huge fan of David Wayne in his movies. I checked out uh, oh, yeah. a few Tile and Stupid Jester. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's not his best um, because David Wayne. I think he's actually worked very well with Netflix with. You know, uh, the Wet Hot American Summer uh, t- prequel and sequel uh, shows. He also has done great little comedies. Uh, oh, sh- Joel, what's that one with um, Paul Rudd and Amy Poehler, the one that where they make fun of romantic they comedies? They came together? Yes. That one's really hilarious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that one's hilarious. Um, the the 10 is hilarious. I need, where... I need to see I need to see the 10 and Wet Hot American Summer still. But I, I, I Oh, God, do... Joel, get yeah, on now. <laughs> I know. I, I, I do boy. plan to because I love role models and I love oh, – uh, no. I thought uh, Wanderlust was fun and uh, – He's a really they, good comedic filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> like – and yeah. the thing is with uh, this one, with uh, you know, starring Will Forte, focuses on Doug Kinney, one of the co-creators behind National Lampoon. I had no idea he actually – well, I'm not going to spoil like what happens, but like I had no idea that his life went the way it went. Let's just say that. And so they took it more of you know a – kind of comedy almost slightly drama a little bit and that was something kind of different for Wayne and you know Will Forte is a good actor a lot of people don't give him credit and you know he's really good at the David Wayne style of dry humor and wit and then he can also pull off those kind of smaller dramatic moments and it wasn't the best in David Wayne's filmography I'm gonna be completely honest it was it was serviceable but if you are interested in to watch something different on Netflix, I would highly suggest that. Uh, so Joel and I watched the weird one on Monday. I watched that one um, on Wednesday, and then of course uh, the one we're about to talk about is the one I watched on Thursday. And speaking of that, before we get to that um, and the movie news and stuff, please spread this around and let people know this is the definitive movie podcast. You you, you want to just push this on your friends, your family, your grandma, your grandpas, and be like, listen to these guys. They they cool as hell. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so in order to get to Winchester, we have to talk about the news first. And if you want to jump to just our Winchester movie review, the time will be in the description below. But Joel, some movie news. There's there's, there's some stuff that dropped that um, are fascinating, including the trailer section. My God, is that an eclectic uh, group. Um, with the movie news, though, this uh, piece of news doesn't surprise me just because this man – just seems like the nicest human being in the world. So when you portray one of the nicest personalities on TV, it just makes total sense. So in the most uh, uh, non-surprising news in the history of uni- the universe, <laughs> uh, Tom Hanks is being tapped to uh, play Mr. Rogers in the Mr. Rogers movie, You Are My Friend. This makes total sense. I mean, Tom Hanks is the type of guy to where when you see him in movies or, hell, even on the red carpet or in interviews – he just seems like a down to earth, like nice individual. And Mr. Rogers kind of has that warm presence where like, even if you're in the worst mood and you put on Mr. Rogers neighborhood, which, you know, Joel and I were in the right age group that grew up with that. Like, Oh yeah. He just seemed like the type of, Oh, I know exactly. It's like PBS was like, you either watched Arthur or Mr. Rogers. (laughs) Like that was basically it. And so, uh, I watched both. (laughs) Yeah, I did. I did too. And so, you know, Joel and I are at that right age group to where, you know, at Sundance, the Mr. Rogers documentary just premiered, and now they're going to have you know a fictional uh, story about this man, and I think that's awesome because he was one of the most influential, uh, you, you know, personalities and TV show hosts that Joe and I had growing up in the '90s. So this makes total sense. Great casting, uh, and this also seems like he's going to take, um, you know, kind of like that Oscar out. Uh, and really kind of bring us a, a different performance and really make it just – it's going to be different. And, like, I, I can't wait to see, like, how Tom Hanks brings his talents 
to twist it into something to where I want to see him sink into this role. I don't want to see him at all, and I want to just see Mr. Rogers. So, Joel, when you hear this news, is this like, yeah, no duh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't have many thoughts about this because they're all very clear cut, um, <laughs> and it's easy to and it's easy to tell everybody what they are. Basically, Tom Hanks is the nicest person in the history of the world. And Fred Rogers was the nicest person in the history of the world. So one of them playing the other one makes total sense. I I can't wait to see this. I was uh, a big, 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 big fan of the show. Uh, You know, like Chase was saying, you (laughs) pretty much either watched Arthur or Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood or both of them. Or both of them and the Magic Magic School Bus. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, You know, obviously Sesame Sesame Street as well. Reading Rainbow. (laughs) Reading Rainbow, exactly. So what we need to have is like some big mashup where LeVar Burton oh god <laughs> uh, plays like LeVar Burton and Tom Hanks get together to play the you know Fred Rogers and um I forgot what the name was uh, of the guy I I guess he was just playing himself um in Reading Rainbow and then they get together with the Sesame Street guys and try to figure out with the magic school bus crowd, maybe who murdered Arthur? I don't know. Um, that would <laughs> be hilarious. Case, that would be awesome. <laughs> the happy, the happy time murders too. Um, <laughs> it's party. gonna be about Arthur, and <laughs> a buster. Arthur. <laughs> there we go. Uh, no, but uh, it, this makes total sense. I mean, it's. I can't wait to see that documentary as well. Uh, yeah. Which they kind of have reflective names. It's uh, the documentary is called "Will You Be My Friend?" Yeah. And then this one is you are my friend. Obviously, friend is going to be, you know, used in a title about a movie about Fred Rogers. I, it's just, you know, it's it's perfect. And uh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see how this turns out. Uh, it's very likely that Hanks will get Oscar consideration for this, which will be kind of bizarre to me. I don't know why. I mean, it, it fitting, but bizarre. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I can't wait. I mean, the fact that Tom Hanks is now going to be, I mean, he's already tackled Walt Disney. Now he's going to tackle, you know, Fred Rogers is like, the guy can just do anything. Like, he can literally go from, like, (laughs) this tycoon to, like, this smaller type of individual um, who wore awesome sweaters. So, uh, yeah, so that news, obviously, there's really nothing to talk about. It's, like, perfect, perfect. Uh, This one's kind of weird. But then again, um, every time when I see her in movies or, uh, or TV shows or uh, just being known uh, to be connected with Jim from The Office. Like, she's just, she's always one of my favorites. And I always love seeing her pop up and stuff. And I'm really looking forward to actually, speaking of Jim, her and John's collab effort in uh, A Quiet Place. Yeah, super excited for that. Oh, my God. Joel, you have no idea. Like, every time I watch it in theaters, people think there's something wrong with the audio. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> just, just enjoy the experience, you idiots. Because um, they keep talking, like, what's wrong with the audio? I'm like, no, no, that's the whole point of the movie. Stop it. Um, but yeah, no, uh, Emily Blunt is who we're talking about and she is joining the rock for the jungle cruise movie. Now speaking on jungle cruise itself as a business move, this is great because when Joel and I, uh, talked about the whole jungle cruise thing a while back, I, I, I could care less. It's like, whatever. But the, with the, I know Joel's gonna roll his eyes, but with the success box office wise, not critic wise, uh, of Jumanji, this makes total sense to fast track this because everyone loves <sighs> Jumanji. I know Joel has died died inside. Um, with the success of Jumanji, you want to fast track this because they have similar type of adventure tones to them, and it's perfect because you know The Rock is in both. But adding Emily Blunt to this makes total sense because she's about to be in a huge, well, I'm assuming huge Disney hit at the end of the year with Mary Poppins Returns. So she's mm. she has worked with Disney for like the past like year. Or so this makes total sense for for her to just transition over to another property, and she's very likable. She's got a nice, uh, you know, warm presence to her. Uh, I've always enjoyed watching her on screen, and I hated a girl on the train. Uh, but uh, she was the best part about that movie, uh, hands down. Like she actually tried because that's the thing with Emily Blunt. She never, I, she's never seemed like to me an actress that phones it in. Even with a quiet place, uh, I'm sorry, John, but uh, I, your wife is better than you. Uh, but in that trailer, <laughs> in that it's true though. In the trailer, 
she gives a little bit more range to her character within the span of two minutes. And that's just how good she is, and which is going to be interesting because John directs that movie, so he's directing his wife. Um, but, uh, yes. So, and this this also makes perfect sense because I'm going to make a bold prediction right now, and I don't know how Joel feels about this, but every time I watch a Quiet Place trailer, I know it's done by Paramount. I know they're kind of hit and miss with people, uh, especially with, like, box office stuff. Um but I think A Quiet Place will be this year's Get Out or this year's Cloverfield, even more than God Particle. I think this will be like the horror movie that everyone will talk about, hopefully. But that's just you know my prediction on But in terms of Jungle Cruise, sure. she She's a great actress. She's worked with Disney now with the Mary Poppins sequel. Makes total sense business-wise. So, I mean, Joel, like, uh, we haven't seen anything from Mary Poppins yet except for photos. Like, her being in another Disney film... Do you think this is good for her career? Or do you think she should stick to more like adult fare? Uh, I think that she she should have that range. Uh, to be completely honest, I think it makes total sense. Um, she's also you know obviously starred with a big movie star, you know a big male movie star, I should say, before you know with Edge of Tomorrow, uh, where she was opposite Tom Cruise and uh, you know remained head to head to, head to head with him performance wise. I thought. Um, so it makes sense that, you know, they would, they would have her join this. Uh, I will just say to the makers of Jungle Cruise, if you're listening, which you aren't, but if you are, (laughs) um, please find, and, and, and I guess I'm also speaking to Weird Al Yankovic here, please find a way to incorporate Weird Al Yankovic's great song, Skipper Dan, into this movie. Uh, if people are confused by that, it's because it, I think honestly it has the wrong title, but... Go listen to the lyrics and you'll understand what I mean because that's a great song about a guy who cannot stand his job with a Jungle Cruise ride. Um, and uh, I'm just, I just hope that at some point there's an action scene and maybe – even if it's like an instrumental or something, just just use Skipper Dan. Please. Please do this. Um, I'm mostly being sarcastic here. I don't, I don't, I don't care either way. Um, <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I, I think that certainly it's, it's fun how they're, they're getting rock, the rock for, or Dwayne Johnson, I should say, for all of these kind of family friendly ish, um, you know, big high concept action movies because of course he had Jumanji, blah. Um, he. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny uh, every know, time yeah. I bring it up you, you just like you almost like throw up a little bit <laughs> um so, so uh you know he had he had uh San Andreas with this director I believe right is this I think this is Brad Payton yeah, uh, I believe so I think because I think that this is the one that he went straight to after Rampage um yes which is another Dwayne Johnson movie and then I think he also has Skyscraper this this year so it's like he's he's getting he's getting all of these projects that are high concept action movies and I like that you know even if the movie isn't very good which was certainly the case with um, Jumanji and San Andreas um, and <laughs> a movie with the director of our next project um, <laughs> Chase hates me um, well no no, no. I'm, I'm gonna make Joel even more angrier when I when I uh, s- <laughs> straight face tell him how I'm going to introduce the director but just one one final thing on the Jungle Cruise thing I know a lot of people are going to get angry when I say this but I think this makes perfect sense for The Rock to do more films like Jumanji and more family friendly fare because I hate to break it to people even if you're an adult and you're a hardcore fan of it the WWE is a family event it's a family show and so yeah. when you when you have stars bleed into this industry in this this sector of the industry, because they're already actors to begin with, they're stage actors. So that when they come over into film, they're they're going to stride better with Family Fair and not stuff like Baywatch. That's why I'm just so confused as to why John yeah. Cena would do the Duke Nukem theme because he's going to fare better with family films. Yeah, I guess perhaps you know they want to branch out a little bit, but it, it is it is a bit baffling uh, that they would take on those roles. Um, you know, that's why I think that for the early part of Dwayne Johnson's career, he was kind of just regarded as, you know, a WWE or WWF at that point, um, you know, performer who was kind of struggling because he was taking a lot of roles that were very self-serious. You know, he was the Scorpion King. He was the guy from Doom. 
there wasn't there wasn't a lot of uh, you know in at least in the traditional sense there wasn't a lot of charisma in those roles. It, they weren't fun movie roles. They were kind of plot devices. So you know, then again, I mean, of course, he had stuff like where he was a genuine character, like in Be Cool or whatever. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I certainly think that that Dwayne Johnson's career has been more lucrative as of late because like you said he's been connecting with family audiences you know singing in Moana and doing all these action movies that are PG-13 and lower um you know very you know I don't I don't think he's been in an R-rated movie in a while Baywatch and, Yeah well I mean like other than that you know Oh I, yeah I think the last one honestly was like Snitch or Faster Snitch uh yeah I think it might be Faster cuz Snitch was PG-13 so uh, oh, okay. I think it, I think it might have been faster actually, uh, unless there's something between those two. But um, but yeah, I, I you know R-rated movies that are not comedies because those are it's kind of a different uh, measuring stick there. But um, but yeah, it's it's kind of baffling that they would take these roles. But I like I like the the fact that Dwayne Johnson seems to have caught on to that. Maybe at some point John Cena will. I, you know, I, I feel like perhaps he's trying to uh, make some sort of a Dwayne Johnson like Mark in a very, uh, you know, he's he's certainly a, a household name, but he's not as big of a star in the movie world, and so perhaps taking this kind of shocking role that's a lot of, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of cursing and a lot of a lot of all that. He's you know, just trying to be a bit of a different WWE star uh, that's transitioned to movies. I don't know. It's uh, it's certainly interesting because, you know. Well, well, hey, listen, we'll see how it fares out, but I want people to keep this in mind because uh, I bet John Cena's team, you know, is over the moon about it. But John Cena voices a lead character in an Oscar-nominated movie now. So think about that. Uh, Dwayne Johnson does not have that under his belt, so there you go. Well, actually, no, yes, well, yes, he did. Moana. He was in Moana. Yeah, okay. Well, well he, was, he wasn't the lead, though. Like, John oh, Cena like, yeah. is literally about his bull character. Yeah, so, it's, named, it's named after him, yeah. That's exactly. True. So now uh, I usually like to make Joel angry, uh, and he's going to get really <laughs> infuriated when I introduce F. Gary Gray as this. Uh, F. Gary Gray is a filmmaker and he's only made one movie in his career. Uh, he did very well with Fate of the Furious. He's never made anything <laughs> else beyond that. And so he's being tapped to do more movies. And Joel is going to say that he's done other stuff, but it's not true. He's only done Fast 8, which is Joel's favorite movie of last year. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, no, uh, F. Gary Gray, he's been in the business for a while. Uh, most recently, uh, um, even not a lucrative hit like Fate of the Furious, but more of a critical hit. Uh, and a critical darling with uh, Straight Outta Compton, which was one of my favorites of 2015. Um, he, he's a really great director that can tap into whatever genre he wants to do. He can do it. Now, he's being tapped to do the reboot of Men in Black. Now, there's actually a couple things with this story. One, F. Gary Gray is going to direct a Men in Black movie. But the second thing is they're saying reboot. So that is also fascinating because... I'm not like a, the biggest fan of two or three, but I like the first one, and it has to do with the chemistry of Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. Now, if you're going to reboot this franchise, it's going to really rely on the two main leads and their type of chemistry. I do not want them to just get impersonators of a Will Smith or Tommy Lee Jones because that's not going to fly with anyone. So you need to have fresh blood, get different people, and have their own unique personalities because if you start getting people and they try to act like the previous people, it just it comes off as lazy, and you might as well just get the original people at that point. So, um, this I, I, I'm cool with it. I mean, I, I have a I have an, uh, a feeling that he is probably being looked at because of his you know work in Fate of the Furious, which does have some pretty impressive action sequences. So, if you're gonna you know have an action comedy. It just makes perfect sense uh, to do that. And this this is more sci-fi too. So um, Fate of the Furious could be considered sci-fi considering some of the balls out action it has. Um, but this, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's an interesting pick. Um, I don't know how I feel about it yet until I see a trailer. But you know what? F. Gary Gray is a talented individual. I love me some Straight Outta Compton. Um, I've seen the movie so many times. Uh, I've only seen Fate of the Furious surprisingly once. Uh, 
and Joel's That's like, because yes. it's terrible. Because it's amazing. Because I just it's haven't awful. had time to watch a two and a half hour long movie yet. Um, but th- <laughs> this um, is is going to be. Um, you know, Sony. Listen, I, I I rag on Sony quite a bit, but they they had such a success last year with uh, Jumanji and Spider Man that they can pretty much do whatever they want now. So if they want to try different stuff and they want to reboot, um, you know, Men in Black, go for it. I mean, if it's terrible, then you got, always got the Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones version. So whatever. Uh, so Joel, uh, I mean, I know. Okay, let, let's speak. Like professionals here, I know you don't like the, you know the the Furious films, but I mean F. Gary Gray is a a director of many uh, different talents. Like, is he the right pick for this? So uh, let's be clear they're they're definitely not basing their decision on the fact that he directed Straight Outta Compton. I know that it's no, I know. a movie that has some <laughs> prestige, but it's not an action movie. It's not within the wheelhouse. They're they're basing it on his, you know the part of his filmography where he directs action movies. And, um, you know, I liked the Italian job. I think yeah, he directed it was not that a bad, one. Uh, remake. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like that one, but I can't think of, is there something else he directed that I'm not thinking of? Uh, like between, I know that there has to be, but in any case, um, uh, he directed, uh, the negotiator law abiding citizen, Oh, Law Abiding Citizen was terrible, I thought. I haven't seen The Negotiator. I, I know that that one's that's, it's very uh, uh, popular. It's got Samuel L. Jackson and uh, Christopher Plummer. Ha! Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I had, to, I had to slip that in there. Um, I haven't seen that, but we have it at work, and I need to, I need to just blind buy it because I've, I've heard it's really good. Um, I wasn't a fan of Law Abiding Citizen. I thought that was a very mean-spirited, uh, in a way that was off-putting. Uh, very mean spirited movie. Um, and the, you know, I've already had my say on the fate of the furies. I think it's awful, but, uh, (laughs) in any case, here's, and here's the reason why I don't, you know, I don't think we need this movie at all. I I think that we're fine with the ones we have, you know, even if we don't talk about men in black Two, that movie doesn't exist. Um, (laughs) I thought that the third one was fine. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not great or it's not, it's not as good as the first one, but I think it's fine. And, uh, of course I'm a, I'm a fan of the first one. I remember seeing it back when it came out. Um, saw it in theaters, great stuff. Uh, but I just don't see the need for this and I don't see, and I further don't see the need for this if, if F Gary Gray is involved on the basis of the fact that his last movie where he was allowed to let loose and shoot action scenes was the fate of the furious i i just i just don't like that movie at all and i don't yes like joel that. And I, we and know I <laughs> and i don't like the action scenes and if they're hiring him because of action scenes i just can't get behind it i i don't see the need so that's just me whatever oh well well listen folks we can't win them all joel hates like 90 percent of the movies i watch anyway so i can't win this man over anything so but hopefully we can win him over with this because this uh Listen, if you're going to make a Leonardo da Vinci movie, it only makes sense that you get the actor that has the same first name as the person that uh, they're portraying. Um, so Leonardo DiCaprio is going <laughs> to play Leonardo da Vinci, which is funny because <laughs> his mother named him Leonardo after uh, looking at a da Vinci painting. Um, there's a little tidbit for you. They are moving forward with that, and so I'm assuming after the uh, – you know, Quentin Tarantino movie with Manson and stuff, he's probably going to get, you know, shooting on th- uh, this one. And this one's going to be about the painter. And they have hired John Logan to uh, write the script. Now, he has done a lot of interesting works, uh, one of which is a movie that Joel and I will always back up, and I don't understand the hate for it last year, Alien Covenant. He has also done the Bond films with Spectre and Skyfall, and he's got some nominations with Gladiator, The Aviator, and Hugo, so he has worked with uh, Leo before on The Aviator, um, and I know Joel loves that movie. I still haven't seen that one. That's one of the few Scorsese movies I haven't seen, Um, but he's a good pick. He's got a nice resume like it's one of those resumes where you go yeah there's some good stuff there and i i kind of want to see um a biopic about you know a a painter i I feel like i mean joel's probably seen thousands of movies based on him but i feel like in the we haven't really seen a really good biopic um on a famous painter or abstract artist in a while 
I could be wrong, uh, maybe because I'm just old, my brain's just dying out, but I, uh, I'm excited for this. I, I like anything Leo does. I, I have no problems with him. He's one of those actors that always picks his projects, you know, lightly. He doesn't, you know, just sign on to everything. He always will work with, you know, geniuses like Tarantino or Scorsese or, you know, with, uh, um, uh, Joel and Blank and uh, Revenant. Uh, Inaratu. Uh, in, yeah, in, so. Inaratu. In in Inaratu, yes. Uh, so um, he works with a lot of great directors. He's not one of these actors just like, I'm just going to do everything. Well, no, he picks his uh, projects accordingly. And um, if he's going to be portraying the legendary Da Vinci with this screenwriter, it seems like a good uh, good pick to me. So, Joel, does this tickle your fancy? Yeah, I, I suspect that somebody approached him and said, "Hey, so you know how you have a really similar name?" To da Vinci? <laughs> Wait, so it's like, almost like a, done. I'm it, gonna play him. <laughs> it's almost like if uh, uh, someone approached Joel and was like, uh, "Would you like to portray Billy Joel or something?" It's like, what? Just because my name is there doesn't mean anything. <laughs> like what? <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting because I, I feel like he does kind of look like him, at least in the kind paintings of a that we've bit. seen uh young you know obviously a younger version um so i like him i like john logan as a screenwriter i think he's done a lot of really solid work you know particularly the aviator i think he also wrote like rango which was one of those that you wouldn't expect him to write but um yeah i i uh i'm a fan of this news for sure yeah i mean it's just one of those things where it's like cool uh you know leonardo DiCaprio, you do your thing brother all right so the next one <laughs> It's not really like, you know, earth shattering news, but it's just a nice piece of news that I figure I'd throw in here because, you know, Black Panther is going to change the game uh, in terms of black superheroes leading the charge. And yes, I'm not an idiot. I realize Blade exists and I realize that, you know, the Falcon and War Machine, they're in this MCU as current um, black representatives of, you know, uh, you know, people that aren't white, basically. And so but this is a big deal. And so Octavia Spencer, the lovely uh, Octavia, is, uh, you know, going to Mississippi and, um, you know, buying a, a, a crowd of seats for Black Panther for, you know, underprivileged communities. And it's just it's just stuff like that that just makes me smile. It makes my heart warm. And it just shows just how powerful and how impactful this movie is going to be. I don't think people understand, like, how big this movie is going to be. Like, Joel and I are like, we're not even prepared for one, seeing the movie, and two, knowing how much it's going to make and what the buzz is going to be about. This is, this is going to be something special. And I'm glad that, you know, you know, actors are, you know, still great out there and they have good hearts and they do stuff uh, <laughs> like this. Um, but, I mean, I know Joel probably agrees, but like, Octavia Spencer, she's just, she's just lovely. <laughs> she's so yeah, lovely. She's- She's a perfect human. By the way, yeah. you forgot you forgot one. You forgot you forgot a black superhero, and I can't believe this. I can't believe that you forgot about Steel as played by. Oh Shaquille my god! O'Neal. Okay, we're moving on. Then that's ridiculous. <laughs> like, listen, th- this is this is exactly why Black Panther needs to be made because of Steel and Catwoman and all these garbage movies. All right, so uh, oh god. You just I, made I, me have, I love you, Chase. I love you made you me so have much. like severe PTSD over here. Like <laughs> you need to stop that. All right, um, that movie. Uh, if you think Kazam is bad, watch Steel. Uh, oh, Shaq's yeah. acting career is not good. Yeah, uh, people people remember Kazam as being bad, and it's bad. But they uh, Steel has Steel kind of disappeared bad. because there wasn't wide circulation of the DVD after it came out, and now it's kind of disappeared because it's out of print. If people rediscovered that movie. I think that it, the, all of the conversations about Kazam would shift. Oh, so, God. It yeah. just – yeah, Steel's pretty rough. So if you want to watch like a really bad like <laughs> movie, please seek that out. All right. So the final uh, bit of news, I'm going to have Joel take over on this one because, listen, I told you guys this before and I'll say it again. If it involves Star Wars or Harry Potter, uh, Joel is the knowledgeable one about the franchises and I would feel like an idiot if I were to explain it or you know have my thoughts. <laughs> I want to have Joel – Speak on these, you know, first because um, he, he knows better. So, Joel, what what is now? Okay, listen. And I was telling my girlfriend this earlier. Fantastic Beasts, uh, The Crimes of Grindelwald is already having an uphill battle with Johnny Depp. Now yep. they're facing another, you know, backlash a little bit. What was the controversy this week? Yeah, I mean, it's really it's kind of a rough time for that movie right now before before it even releases a trailer because. You had not only do you have Johnny Depp in the cast, but you had 
like everybody except for Daniel Radcliffe coming to the defense of him being in the movie, um, including J.K. Rowling, and that was really disappointing to see. But the latest is the fact that uh, David Yates, the director, was being interviewed and uh, was asked a question about whether or not Dumbledore's sexuality, a uh, reminder to people, is that uh, Rowling always considered him gay. It was never really like overtly mentioned in the series, but of course it's canon because Rowling considers it um, to be that way. So uh, David Yates was asked whether or not his sexuality would be openly dealt with in, the, in this particular movie because, of course, Jude Law was cast in the role, and he said, not in this movie. So, you know, an uproar kind of came about, and, um, you know, once again, conversations about um, representation came up. Here's the thing. So uh, I totally understand all the conversations about representation. I realize why it matters, particularly right now, the current political climate is one that seems to be wanting to silence a lot of people who are in marginalized communities who want representation in their art. You know, we just were mentioning Black Panther. Um, so, but here's the thing. So we're, there's a battle here. There's one between, uh, you know, what people want to be the case and there's, the the facts of the plot as it stands and i think that what we need to remember is that dumbledore has kind of been written a certain way and i i'm not a purist i'm i'm i want to like stress that i hate purism i i think it's cynical i'm not one who harped on all the harry potter movies for everything that they left out cuz i could have you know if i was a purist i could have done that um but the entire like point of the series would be changed or point of Dumbledore's place in the series would be changed if he were written another way. And right now what the, the fact of the matter is, is that he uh, has, you know, he enjoyed a friendship that he wanted to be something more with Grindelwald. And I've already kind of gone through the story uh, in previous, in a previous episode, but because of the death of his sister, uh, now he you know doesn't trust that about himself. So he's not going to be openly anything, let, a, let alone gay. He's a very guarded person in general. And uh, so I feel like the, the conversation is about the expectation that the only gay character that we know about uh, is not going to be openly gay in, the, in this movie. Mm-hmm is kind of placing an undue burden on the character to be what he isn't. So that's my feeling, but that's essentially the controversy. Uh, I know a lot of people have their own feelings. Um, you know, tell us your feelings about this. If you disagree with me, try to be civil about it, but, <laughs> you know, because it could easily turn into ju- just a gigantic, you know, you don't want gay characters in the in the series. It's not what I'm saying. Uh, I, I totally do. I, I, I think that there should be, particularly in this series, because of what it's about. But we also have to kind of deal with the reality of a character that only has possibly told one person about this truth about himself. Uh, And that is going to be like 30 years removed from the story, and it's going to be McGonagall. And that's about it. And we don't even know if he he tells her that. Um, There's there's details in uh, the Pottermore story about McGonagall's history that suggests that he does, but we don't even know, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes, it's pretty, like, possible that he never tells anyone about this uh, part of himself, so he's not going to be openly anything. Um, He's going to be very guarded, he's going to be very conflicted about everything, particularly the fact that somebody he once loved is involved in mass, you know, genocide and trying to find ultimate power and all that. Um... So that's that's pretty much the controversy. Uh, I want to I, I do want to know people's thoughts. So please comment. Uh, let me know if you believe that it's more important that the representation factor is uh, more important than the details of the plot because uh, that's what I think is at issue here. Um, but let me know what you think. Yeah, and people have to keep in mind like <clears throat> Joel and I are always inclusive of everyone being represented and people have to keep in mind that in this fantastic beast universe the time period that they're in 
it's very hard for gay people to come out. And they're very repressed at this time. So he's going to be, like Joel said, very guarded, very uh, defensive about every that. Like he's, He probably wouldn't even bring it up because of the time frame that they're in. Uh, gay people were looked on way worse in that time period than they are now. So it, it does make Particularly sense. Particularly because um, – not only because he's gay but also because he's a wizard. Exactly. With, you know, it's been um, established now that there is a violent history between muggles and wizards. So, or no mages, I should say, I guess. <laughs> but and and wizards. Um, so, you know, and then there's there's also the fact that, um, uh, and of course, I just lost it. I I just had I had a I had a brain fart just now. Cranial flatulence. I F- folks, uh, this is what happens every day when I talk to Joel. I'll be like, Joel, let's talk about this, and he's just like, "What?" Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah, uh, whatever the case. Um, those are my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it's just like I'll say one last thing, and I'll, I'll 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 stop. Like Warner Brothers, please get your your stuff together because. The fact that you're facing the whole Johnny Depp thing, J.K. Rowling speaking, you know, pretty much for that, and now with this, it's like this movie is already having such bad publicity before it even, like Joel said, even a poster comes out. It's like you guys have to get a handle on this because it's getting it's going to get worse as the movie comes out because people keep bringing stories like this up. And it's going to really affect uh, your your movie. Um, so please get a hold of that. So Joel, what was your favorite piece of news? Let's say it together. One, two, three. Hanks Tom as uh, Rogers <laughs> Mister. Um, Hanks Tom. Hanks Tom. Um, H A H A N X being um, <laughs> being as Michael Scott would call him, Mita Rajas. Mita uh, <laughs> Rajas. Yeah, no, uh, yeah. that that's obviously our favorite story. Um, all right, so moving on to trailers, Joel. I you know I was a little disappointed that last week. We really have that many trailers, but th- this week made up for it. All right, so the yeah. first one, uh, Black Panther had its world premiere on Monday, and so Monday night people were able to uh, post their thoughts on social media. The, the embargo is still up, uh, so they can't have full reviews, but they can have their first impressions, as typically what Marvel does. And on the same day, didn't even expect this, they dropped the Ant Man and the Wasp first. Trailer. Now, this is the sequel to the 2015 hit uh, with Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly, Michael Douglas, uh, about the Ant Man character who can shrink, and um, his poor little uh, pet named Anthony dies. And that made my heart sting. Uh, anyways, Ant Man had the privilege, and actually, the sequel has the privilege again. Um, the, the, the first one had the privilege to come after, the first one after uh, the second Avengers. Now, the sequel has also the advantage of coming after the third Avengers, which is great a great setup for it because it's going to do really well box office-wise. But this one picks up, I'm assuming, because my girlfriend and I were actually arguing about this, Like we don't, we don't know where this is going to take place because if this movie's coming out after Infinity War, we know that shit's going down in Infinity War, so what are the events in this one? And so we have a, I, we yeah. have a feeling that it's like right after Ant-Man. Type of deal. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, you know, we know that uh, when we don't know it, but we've been told um, conflicting reports that generally speaking, the events of each phase kind of happen simultaneously. Of course, that's going to be a bit different because uh, they they mentioned Civil War in the trailer, by the way. So these are events that happen after Civil, Civil War. Maybe it's like within the same few months. I'm I'm not sure, but I'm assuming so. Yeah, but I mean, even so, it might be somewhere between them. But it would have to be really soon because it also seems to kind of take place. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's it's a it's a weird timeline. It's kind of muddied bit a bit. But I think maybe maybe Phase Three has kind of um, maybe Phase Three is a bit different. But I know that. For whatever reason, phase phases one and two, the movies within them all kind of take place at the same time. So, like, yeah, that's what they were saying. When Iron Man takes place, Thor is also taking place. When Iron Man three is taking place, Thor two is also <laughs> taking place. Yeah. So, uh, of course, then you you know you have the question of when Iron Man two takes place, but nevertheless, um, it's kind of a it's it it seems to be like maybe 
within a few years, but then I think there's like this big time jump. I, I'm not I'm not entirely yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely <laughs> sure either, but you know what? If they keep pumping out stuff like this, I'm cool with it because this show is great. It's it's a load of fun. Um, it yeah. carries the, the spirit and the humor of the first one. I've loved Paul Rudd for many, many, many years. That man is just, I'll watch him in anything. We're about to talk about actually another trailer with him uh, you know, shortly, but he's just one of those actors that's charismatic. I always love watching him. Him and Michael Douglas, eventually, they all have great chemistry. I don't need to say anything more because the first... The first Ant Man is not groundbreaking in the MCU, but it was it was a nice uh, installment in the um, overall franchise of this universe, and it was a lot of fun. And I, I've always said that Scott Lang is actually the most complex one of the, one of the more complex uh, MCU heroes that we have because one, he's kind of an anti hero ish, like he's he's a criminal, like he gets in trouble, and he's the only one that. I know of that has a daughter. And so the other, the other, I guess, um, thing that would be close to that is that Peter Parker's a teenager, but like, you know, he actually fights and stuff, but this is the only hero that we have that actually has a kid. And so there's a lot of, you know, emotional depth that you can play with on top of him being a criminal. And then on top of him, you know, being a hero doing the right thing, he's actually one of the more complex. And when you bring in Paul Rudd to, not only add those dramatic beats, but also add his amazing improv. It's just a great character uh, overall in the you know its package. And you know, Evangeline Lilly, I loved her in the first one, um, and I can't wait to see her kick ass in this one. Her suit looks great. I love that knife sequence at the very end. It's so uh, uh, amazingly choreographed. And of course, Joel and I were arguing earlier this week which one. Which one was funnier, the uh, Hello Kitty Pez dispenser or the building shrinking and rolling away with a brief, like a briefcase? <laughs> and so, uh, it's just a great trailer to basically ha- go, "Hey, if you like Infinity War, this is the next one," and I'm cool with that. So, um, you know what? You know what's really funny with Joel is that, yes, he is not like he does not head over heels like I am with like this universe or comic book movies, but you know he likes them when they're good and. What's fascinating is that Joel loved Spider-Man Homecoming. He liked Thor Ragnarok. He's looking forward to Black Panther. He thought the Infinity War trailer was uh, fun. And I know he likes this one. So, Joel, what kind of virus have you gotten? Because it seems like the past five you're actually into. I guess it's Mickeyitis or something. I'm like <laughs> M- MCUitis. Uh, trying MCU-itis. to make that into a word. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I just feel like maybe they've loosened up a little bit. They've they've kind of um, you know been able to turn away a bit from just you know origin story after origin story after origin story, um, doing the same thing over and over again. I felt like they did you know something a bit different in 2017, and it looks like they're doing something a bit different in 2018. So I'm I'm looking forward to it. I'm I'm looking forward to this least out of the three, uh, you know, with Black Panther and Infinity War, but. Uh, certainly it looks fun. Um, I have many questions about the building suitcase. Uh, <laughs> like, are there people where, in it? <laughs> well, yeah, like, are there, well, yeah, I mean, are there people in it? When you, when you shrink a building, does that include everything in the building? I, I don't, also, what is anybody thinking when they go up on the roof and see a gigantic handle? <laughs> and what are they thinking when, like, construction workers come in and, operate on the building in the exact place where the um the little you know the little pipe that holds the handle on the inside of the suitcase what, what are they thinking when they see that are they thinking is a shut down elevator I, I i don't know uh many questions about that um i i i thought that the hello kitty pez dispenser i laughed out loud at that i love that because it reminds me of the in, inner suitcase battle of the first yes. one where they use like an iPhone and, a, <laughs> and hard candies and, um, you know, obviously like the big climax is set on a toy train set. It's, it, that, that's the reason I love the first movie. The first movie yeah. is so good. It's the, it's the, for me at least, the infinitely better one in 2015. Um, and it's because it had this sense of joy and invention. Even if it was, you know, superhero is introduced and fights a villain, it was 
different in the particulars of that, and I like that a lot about it, and I think that there's going to be some playing around with that in this one too. So I'm I'm excited. It looks like a lot of fun. It looks very colorful, very uh, uh, yeah. I just I'm I'm a fan of Paul Rudd in this role. I it was such unique casting, but now you can't think of anybody else in that role. Um, and uh, so I'm I'm certainly and I'm obviously excited to see Evangeline Lilly. You know, like you said, I the the. Uh, <laughs> the bit where Michael Douglas has given her um, blasters at the end of her, you know, her uh, sleeves is mm-hmm. just so funny because he didn't give that to Ant-Man. Yeah. So you're saying that uh, you... her, her suit's got uh, blasters and tasers? He's like, yep. Uh, so did you have that technology when you made my suit? I sure did. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He just decided not to give him any. Um, it's, it's just – it's – funny so really, now, really now funny. uh joel before we get into the next trailer just know that this is probably the happiest trailer and all the rest of these are depressing yeah. <laughs> and like really <laughs> like much. mentally insane pretty much uh and literally that's that's almost the word yep. uh, and it is almost the word that is that makes up the name of the next movie uh and that is unsane this one is from steven soderbergh who is a director you might know from a few movies you know somewhere um and this one he shot entirely on an iPhone, so he went full Sean Baker on us. And uh, it's – I'm not even going to reveal anything about the plot. I'm just going to say Claire Foy. Oh, yeah, go in, in blind. Yeah, go go in. I mean if you want to watch the trailer, fine. It, I would suggest with something like this, maybe just go see the movie, honestly. Um, comes out in – it's March, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah March. it's actually really soon. Yeah, uh, weekend of Isle of Dogs. Um, so – yeah, Claire Foy's in this. She's she's on the crown right now. She's been cast as Elizabeth Salander in the um, Girl with the Dragon Tat- Gr- blah. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo reboot. Uh, really good actress. I'm a big fan of the Crown, and uh, she's she's terrific in that show. And uh, so this one, I'm not going to tell you guys anything about it. And I'm glad that Chase agrees with my decision there. I'm, uh, were you curious how I was going to handle this? Yeah, actually, because the thing is, like, I knew who directed it and what it was shot on, but I had no idea what the story was about. And as you watch the trailer, it just gets crazier yeah, and crazier. You, you realize you realize why you haven't found out. Because yeah. Because they clearly didn't want to tell anything. I mean, the, the first half of this trailer kind of is rough because... A little bit. Uh, yeah, a little, a little rough because it's, you know, really hammering in the iPhone thing, but... Once you get to the second half of the trailer and you realize, man, there's real justification here because an iPhone, you know, particularly with the video quality of an iPhone, which is going to be naturally less um, polished than, you know, like, say, an 8K camera or whatever, um, you know, there's going to be interesting things done with perspective. Uh, you can do very a lot of very interesting things with a small screen like that. So it's uh, it's very interesting. And, and so I just – I don't want to go into the plot. I'm just going to say this looks awesome. And um, <laughs> to tell you guys what I told Chase and Brian in the thread where I was like, oh my gosh, this trailer came out. Um so originally on my website, I was going to review that weekend, Isle of Dogs, Pacific Rim Uprising, and I'm still going to review those. But the third one, you know, theatrically at least, was going to be Sherlock Gnomes. Uh, but but that was before I kind of found out that this was a wide release. Uh, this is definitely going to be released, you know, in many theaters on that day. I know what I'm replacing Sherlock Gnomes with. Um, <laughs> certainly. So guys – who follow my writing, you you aren't going to get a review of Sherlock Gnomes. Sorry, I know that that was your most anticipated review of all time, uh, but yeah, so I'm I'm super stoked for this. Yeah, it's, it's one of those trailers to where it ratchets up the tension appropriately with the subject matter, and it just hooks you in. Now, to comment really quickly on the iPhone cinematography, a lot of people are going to assume that Oh, Soderbergh just had his phone on and started filming. No, it's still going to be on dollies and tracks and tripods. Yeah. It's just the camera of choice is the iPhone. So, yes. so get, get that uh, – because I know a lot of people when you say, oh, shot with an iPhone. Oh, it's going to look like a YouTube video. No, it's going to be on stationary shots. It's just the, the camera of choice is the iPhone. Right, and so uh, what this – basically how this worked when Sean Baker did it for the Florida Project, there was some handheld stuff there, but – 
uh, even the handheld stuff, he had you know like little grips, uh, things that he could or grip like a the monopod. Yeah, yeah. It it wasn't it wasn't like he was just having it in his hand and he was he was on a video <laughs> thing. And plus, it wasn't even shot through the iPhone camera per se. It's it's an app that uh, somebody developed and Sean Baker kind of found it on accident. And it was it's not even like it was an app built for the movie. It was just one that he found and he was like, oh my gosh. I can probably shoot some stuff with this, so he played around with it, and that's and that's what happened. And you know, obviously Soderbergh has his own way with it. I'm sure that it's different now. It's not going to be the same app. <laughs> I'm sure that he probably coordinated with the creators to to pump it up a little bit. But yeah, um, uh, certainly there's like you said, there's going to be the 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 grips and the the little the little things that help um, actually carry the phone around. It's not going to be in the phone in in the hand, and if it is, it's going to be very rare weird occasions where you know where they can do that uh and uh but other than that i mean it's it's gonna be um uh, used like a camera it's not it's not just you know a guy carrying a, a phone around it's not a home video no it's not um, i mean i mean yeah. it, it, that's a little awkward i'm probably not gonna lie like filming with an iphone is probably a little awkward but not as awkward as when your buddy's on a film and uh you part ways and one, because when I saw this trailer, this next one we're about to talk about, I just thought it was so weird. So let me just get into it. So it stars James McAvoy and Alicia Vikander, right? James McAvoy and Michael Fassbender are both in the X-Men films. Alicia Vikander is married to Michael. <laughs> so the fact that this is a romance film is just super awkward, and I'll guarantee that their family reunions are going to be even more awkward. Um, so this <laughs> next one, uh, if, you, if you take that out of the uh, context, the film itself, the trailer... It's called Submergence, and to put it lightly, it's a it's like an epic romance film between these two people. Uh, James McAvoy gets captured, and he's he's really far away from uh, Alicia Vikander's character, and you know they met once before, and they kind of split ways, and they're kind of it's like an on, on and off again thing. But it surprised me in a way, like not to where like I'm excited to see it, but I love these actors. It's more of like. It was unexpected because I had no idea what the movie was or where it was going. And it turned into like this simple, almost like Nicholas Sparks romance into like some like suspenseful thriller. I was like, what am I watching? So um, to be honest with you, I don't really care to see it. I I love McAvoy and Vikander to death, but I just I don't. I just don't feel the need to watch this like in a theater. Maybe like through rental or whatever. Maybe Joel feels differently, but I just don't feel like this is I a do. theatrical type movie. Um, it looks fine. It's based on a novel. I didn't read the novel, but if you're into those like epic romance movies, those you know like old school romance movies that you know just that feel epic in nature, this might be for you. Um, but honestly, this trailer didn't really hit me in a good way to where I was like, yeah, I want to see this. I was more like cool i like these actors but that's not enough for me yeah i completely disagree with everything here uh okay that's this fine. is this is this is actually my favorite trailer of the week um and i know that <laughs> chase is gonna be like what but of course half of his time spent with me is like what yeah exactly uh, <laughs> i just i just like to bring joy into your life chase um and so, i love you for that <laughs> awesome um so here's the reason. So this movie comes from director Vim Vendors, who I haven't seen any of his movies, but I will say that the impression that I've gotten from the fact that he's a um, a renowned documentarian, he does a lot of uh, documentaries using like wide lenses, a lot of uh, nature, some some nature doc or not nature documentaries, uh, documentaries taken out like in wilderness or in secluded places or. You know when uh, he did a movie a u- few years ago that's a dance documentary in 3D called Pina, uh, in in which he used like groundbreaking 3D technology that uh, he had built for him um, in order to capture the uh, the footage. Uh, the the same footage I think or the same uh, technology I think was used with uh, Werner Herzog's uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams where he went into a cave and was looking at drawings and it was in 3d because he wanted to, uh, like amplify the, um, the, the detail, you know, bring it actually out to the audiences, use 3d in the way that it was meant to by the, uh, and you know, basically that was sort of what vendors did here, uh, with, uh, Pina, which I've heard great things about. I haven't seen it, but that's what I'm gathering. And he's also, you know, uh, 
renowned in the past for having directed Wings of Desire, which was, I think, one of Helena Bonham Carter's, Carter's first movies. Uh, he did Paris, Texas with Harry Dean Stanton uh, and, you know, some other things. So he's a renowned – I think he's German, a yeah, renowned German director who apparently if you're going to see his movies, you got to see them on the big screen because he does things with, like, visual scope that are – not being done by any other directors right now. So a lot of this movie seems to take place, you know, in the outside, particularly when he, when this character is taken. Um, and I think that he could be working toward a really like devastating romantic drama rather than just a romantic melodrama of the Nicholas Sparks variety. I think that he's going to be working on a level of actually examining the characters and I wouldn't be surprised if it's pretty long, because um, I think that some of his, I think that his fiction movies are generally long movies. So wouldn't well, be surprised. And it's not by only that. that. Like when you watch the trailer, it feels like there's a lot of moving parts to it. Yeah, I mean that's that's why I think that it's, it looks a little more a little different than something like Safe Haven or whatever. You know the the uh, the bad Nicholas Sparks movies. Um, this I, I'm a big I, I I like the Notebook. Uh, quite a bit. I know that. I do too. Probably gonna get. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a it's a really good movie. And I think that this looks more like on on level with that than yeah. than something like, you know, Safe Haven or uh, whatever. I don't even remember if that was actually a Nicholas Sparks one, <laughs> but uh, you know, Walk to Remember, I guess. Whatever, Walk to Remember was pretty good, but um, yeah, I, I I'm I'm looking forward to this quite a bit. I think that as a as a trailer construction. This was my favorite this year, uh, uh, this week, sorry. Um, particularly, you know, people are like, wait, but what about Unseen? Like I said, first half of the trailer was kind of questionable. I was like, eh, you know, not selling me on this uh, on this iPhone thing here. I was swept up, man. I, I, I can't wait to see this. When does it come out? Do you know? It Did comes it out April 13th. Oh wow! So it's it's soon as well. I like this because it seems like we're getting a lot of trailers like closer to their release, which yeah. is super interesting. A lot of these, um, you know, smaller trailers, I should say. Well, I mean, uh, hey, so. listen, this was your favorite trailer, and now uh, you guys both know, and so is Joel. Joel uh, always worries about my uh, my mental health. Uh, this next trailer <laughs> that we're about to talk about every is my second favorite. of every day. I'm just kidding. It's true though. <laughs> uh, he's always on watch. Uh, no, this next trailer is my favorite, and Joel's about to introduce it. It was one of the most, to put it lightly, batshit insane things I've seen A24 put out in a, a long time, and I'm gonna say it right now. It's my most anticipated from this studio this year. Ooh, I lo- I loved it. So Joel, go ahead. What is it? It's called Hereditary. Uh, it kind of made waves at Sundance as being w- at least one of the best films there uh, to play. Uh, certainly, I think it's either that or We the Animals are, are the two that kind of came out of the gate as being the big critical darlings. Uh, and it stars Tony Collette. And this one's actually, I'm not even going to. Yeah, this don't, is don't. Like this un- is one of those other ones I'm that not, don't. I'm not going to talk about the, the plot. It, basically, she plays a mother. That's, yeah. that's all I'm going to say. Um, she plays a mother, so this is a sequel to Lady Bird. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny though because A twenty four, the official account, actually came out and said the best tw- the best mother since Lady Bird, <laughs> which is so which is so insanity funny. when you watch the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't wait for this. Uh, it was close between this and Submergence, um, but yeah, I uh, <laughs> it's awesome. It is awesome. It looks ab- it looks genuinely terrifying. It yeah. doesn't look like it doesn't look, you know, terrifying in that, you know, PG thirteen jump scare way. It looks and we're, genuinely. We're, we're about to tear a certain movie apart for that. But when you watch stuff like this, it's like, okay, horror is still alive, and you're not <clears throat> Winchester. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it looks great. Tony Collette looks great. Wouldn't be surprised if she gets some sort of like campaign going. I doubt that it's gonna turn into anything because it's horror. But uh, and there's always a, you know, a. Uh, uh, kind of an uphill road with that genre yeah but if we have seen anything like we saw from get out it's like there's a chance but now there were there were other things going on with get out though um this i mean not that there aren't here I, there are other things that this movie doesn't have that are going on with get out i think that uh, that movie was a little easier because of its social stuff this this looks to be straight like psychological thriller horror um 
Which which maybe. actually could lend her nomination more than a straight up horror film. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. I mean, she was nominated out of uh, nowhere, and I remember hearing about this like after the fact. Nobody expected her to be nominated for The Sixth Sense. So yeah, that's she's true. because she's a great actress. Like she was not she was not one of the people that prognosticators uh, predicted that year. That it, it was a complete like nobody saw that coming, and so obviously you know that could happen again. Um, she looks terrific here. And I've heard that it's a pretty amazing, uh, a pretty amazing performance and a movie. So, yeah. I'm I'm very excited for this. Um, oh, I can't I can't wait. I mean, I, I want to say nothing more. Like Joel and I, like we rarely do this, but if you are actually curious about Unsane or Hereditary, you need to just watch the trailer because I don't want to spoil the experience of those two and a half minutes. It's astounding. Or, or our next one. Correct. Uh, yeah, our next one is another one, and I'm sorry that we're like. This is one of those rare weeks where only two of our trailers are we going to be actually like detailed, you know, descriptions. <laughs> uh, but this one is mute. It's going to be uh, Duncan Jones' next movie. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about you, but it was downright bizarre to see from the director of Moon Source Code and Warcraft, considering Warcraft. <laughs> yep. You know what happened it was there? Awful. I mean, I guess they had to have something to pull from that people would have recognized. You know, immediately. People are probably not going to immediately recognize Moon. But hey, Warcraft um, is big in China, and Netflix has a big subscriber base over there, so that makes total sense. Oh yeah, okay, that makes that makes more sense now. I guess I guess it's not as bizarre. It's I guess it was just only bizarre because of how awful Warcraft was. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all don't know this. I hate that movie so oh, much. It's, it's um, bad. Like really. Yeah, bad. I, I saw that like a month early before any of the any of the buzz started because I happened to get uh, a pretty early screening to it. And I was like, yeah, this is not going to go over well. Uh, <laughs> but And it didn't. It was it was fairly low rated, although there are defenders of it that are uh, interesting people. Um, <laughs> anyway, this one, I'm not going to go into it, but it has a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of actors. Uh, Paul Rudd is among them, like like they said. Um, and yeah, just go watch this because it's very unique. And I can't wait to see it. I mean, it comes out on uh, Netflix, and yeah, who's who all is in this? Chase, give uh, take it away. Like, uh, I know Alexander Skarsgård is the mute. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. He he plays the mute man, um, and he's kind of involved in in let's this just say, gangster activity. <laughs> yeah, very labyrinthine gangster activity. It doesn't look like there's just simple gangster activity going on here, uh, like some you know generic simple thing it's it looks mm-hmm. very complicated complex visually especially uh there's a lot going on visually and uh yeah it just looks really compelling yeah so. it's it's one of those things to where I, i'm not going to beat around the bush yes it does look like blade runner um but it's a different story to where it's going to be its own thing and it's such a weird group of people to be in this like we have alexander alexander skarsgård which is you know he's been cleaning up the awards circuit for his excellent role in Big Little Lies, and of course we have Paul Rudd as Ant Man. To his, to his surprise, I don't know if you saw his. Um, oh yeah, he was shocked that he won. Yeah, he was shocked, and then kind of basically gave the award to Robert De Niro. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, l- listen, I if you guys have not. Because I realize that Alexander gets a bad rap for being the dude off of True Blood. But if you have not seen Big Little Lies, that show is amazing. It's got some really dark subject matter. But I need to if, see it. I need if, to watch yeah, it. Yeah, if you can push through it, I think you're going to be really impressed that Particularly it's... Particularly because of the news that just dropped uh, about season two. They, they oh, got Meryl, Meryl Streep. St- yeah. Yeah. Streep's going to be in it, which is insane considering they already have Nicole Kidman and Reese Witherspoon. It's like, L- listen, wow. it's it's a it's an easy watch. It's seven episodes and they're like fifty minutes a piece, so it's like uh, it's such a breeze. Um, yeah, but I think uh, it's basically like good Lifetime because it's okay. it's trashy <laughs> material, but it's so much el- more elevated from like the editing and the directing and the cinematography and the acting to where you're like I'm okay with the the trashy material, um, but it is very dark subject matter with like abuse and stuff and you know living in today's day and age it's you know it's really awkward to watch but uh alexander skarsgård him and nicole kim and both delivered some of the best performances of their career it's amazing um but anyways this one you know speaking of alexander skarsgård he is a good looking man he you know is in a very successful family you know he he comes into true blood takes his shirt off and stuff and he, he does this thing but as we've seen him kind of progress along, you know, with most people in his his family, is that they they just get better and better. 
uh, with Alexander in particular, you know, he's in a bunch of stuff every now and then, but then he'll be in something like Big Low Lies where he shows you that he is actually good. He's not just a six pack walking around. He actually has talent. And now we get to see him do even more in this one. And he doesn't speak because that's actually harder to do to convey uh, facial expressions and emotions and not say a word. That's why Sally Hawkins was so good in The Shape of Water, because she was able to portray someone who cannot speak so well, I was actually convinced that she could not speak. So (laughs) when you apply that type of character in this really imaginative, colorful, futuristic world, I'm all in, man. And Duncan Jones, I... I, Yeah, Warcraft is awful, but I'm hoping this was not a one-hit wonder, but Moon is one of the best movies of the 2000s. It really is. Have you... have you seen Source Code? Source Code's good too, but I, I'm I'm more of a Moon guy. Oh, okay. I'm I'm slightly more of a Source Code guy, but I love both. Yeah, both. I mean they're both great. Um, and Source Code's th- on my top ten of 2011. So. Yeah, I mean it's his movies are good. It's just Warcraft kind of set him back a little bit. And I'm hoping he just gets back up uh, top. So you know, uh, Mute, check it out. Netflix dropping soon. So uh, obviously Joel's favorite trailer was Submergence. Mine was Hereditary because I like weird. Uh, effed up movies and oh boy <laughs> that trailer is effed up indeed all right so let's move on to the review of the week and that would be winchester or known as on imdb uh because people can't make up their minds about marketing nowadays winchester the house that the ghost built wh- whatever all right so um <laughs> here, here's the deal folks um this comes from, I'm going to let Joel go into more detail but it comes from the director uh the spirit brothers uh that's what they go by and um you know, uh, they've been kind of in and out of Hollywood doing, you know, Predestination, Daybreakers, even Jigsaw from last year. They they do movies periodically to where like, hey, that was great, or hey, that wasn't really so great. They're kind of like a hit or miss for me, but I wasn't really looking forward to this one. It was more of like, all right, Helen Mirren, Haunted House, I'm in, but it's, it's pretty tragic, uh, not in a good way. All right, so uh, Joel, what what is this movie about? <laughs> like what what are we doing here? <laughs> yeah, this is one of the least eventful weeks. Um yeah. <laughs> in terms like the movie we're reviewing, there's just not much to say about this. Um so this is like you said, Winchester comes from directors Michael and Peter Spierig. Um and it is about it stars Jason Clark as Dr. Eric Price, who has arrived at the Winchester mansion uh to uh, test the mental fitness of its current inhabitant, who is Sarah Winchester. Uh, she has just recently lost her husband, and well, maybe not recently. I can't remember if it was recently or not, but she lost her husband uh, and daughter, and now she has she owns, I think it's like fifty one percent of the Winchester Repeating Arms Company, and uh, they're the ones who made the guns um, that were given to the Union soldiers in the Civil War, and probably helped a lot in at least you know uh, logistically in helping the union win the arm the win the the um the conflict and um so now she kind of keeps she keeps i think it seems like she keeps construction workers on retainer essentially they they're constantly at work rebuilding and building her house to some degree uh and of course this year this is the year of the great earthquake in um san jose california and so uh you know there's clearly some some of that going on um but she has uh you know she feels that the guns that used to belong to her family now are now possessed by the spirits of the people they were they were used to kill um and so the doc the good doctor is kind of there to Test her mental uh, fitness, but finds that she might be telling the truth about the fact that it's haunted. Um, so, yeah, I, I wasn't like, I mean, I, you know, I thought that the movie looked solid. I wasn't like excited or whatever. I wasn't anticipating this with froth coming out of my mouth. Um, well, but what are, what are you saying, Joel? Are you, are you saying that I get excited with froth coming out of my mouth? I've seen it happen. I'm just kidding. That's true. Um, <laughs> That's true. I, my excitement sometimes is uh, uh, really over the top. Yeah, his he starts like. <laughs> 
convulsing and anyway. <laughs> like Joel, help me, please! I can't wait to see this. <laughs> yeah, froth comes out of his mouth. I, I would think it's a siege. Uh, I would think that they're seizures, but I know it's just he's excited. Um, so, uh, so I just I don't even call nine one one. I I just whenever it's real, I guess he'll just die. Uh, <laughs> Joel, Joel just expects it. He expects to roll me uh, on a gurney into Infinity War. Like it's gonna happen. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, and we are actually seeing it together. It'll be my second viewing, but we are seeing it together. Uh, and, and it'll probably have to happen. So, um, this one, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like hugely excited. I thought that it was, it was, um, going to be a fun, like, well, I thought that it was going to be a bit of a divergence from their usual, but it's really not because they've directed so many different movies. Like the first one I haven't seen, it's uh, undead from 2005, which is a zombie movie there. Um, they had Daybreakers, which was a vampire movie. Uh, I wasn't a huge fan of that for reasons I'll actually talk about in a bit. Um, and then they did Predestination, Time Travel, Jigsaw, Torture Porn, and now they're doing uh, Winchester, which is a haunted house movie. And you know they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty prolific directors, but I uh, wasn't a fan of this one. Uh, it's weird though because whenever I came out of the movie, I was struggling with whether or not I liked some of the little like liked some of the broad strokes of this enough to like it. But as I wrote my review, which can now be read on Joel on film.com plug, um, it became less and less and less kind. Uh, (laughs) so that's factored into my rating here. It's not super low. The movies, you know, it wasn't screened for critics. It's, you know, within it's a PG 13 horror movie. It's not as disastrous as either of those things might make it seem, but it's definitely not very good. Um, I mean, so, I, w- I would like to make a bold claim that the movie that we saw on Monday, Bilal, is actually worse than this, and they're both just not pleasant watches. I gave um, I gave them both the same rating. I think that I would. Which one probably would you get... sit through again? Uh, neither of them. <laughs> I'm just gonna. I, I hate neither of them. I hate to use the L word on movies because I know that movies are hard to make, but this movie was lazy. I mean, it's it's a lazy, it, forgetful, it's lazy, average. Yeah. Type I of guess movie. that's. I guess that. Well, then again, that's one thing that we can't say. The law technically is just because it's animated. But uh, in any case, um, yeah. So this one, I'm gonna. I guess I'll just start. Are, are, are we doing our, our negatives first or our positives? Positives, because it's a negative. Both have negative true. reviews. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I do have one big positive uh, that is like cut into three parts. It's not enough to raise my grade, but it is a. It's like an act of potential that should have been uh, – it's potential when it should have been active. So here's my big positive, that at least it lays the groundwork for a solid haunted house movie. And by that I mean that it provides um, – you know, at least provides us you know, like physically with the three ingredients of a haunted house movie. You have the house, which is a pretty impressive structure, uh, you know, big – big 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 like grand is too too small a word to describe this thing it's about as big as hogwarts it's about as complex as hogwarts <laughs> and because it has many different like you know caddy corners little uh nooks and crannies and crawl space crawl spaces about 175,000 rooms it seems uh, at least from the outside we don't see a lot of the inside but i'm going to get into that in a second um so it provides us with a house that's a very interesting house, and the fact that it's real and it really exists certainly adds some uh, some believability to it, even if this is not really following the story. Um, the other, you know, the next thing is that it provides us with the reason that the house is haunted. In this case, uh, you know, it was a Confederate colonel, or a Confederate Army colonel, who uh, lost a couple of his brothers and decided to take revenge on it. I don't really think that's a spoiler because it's part of the plot. Um, and that's, that's the, that's the ghost that's haunting the house. Uh, and then, you know, you get the residents of the house and the visitor and the residents are, you know, Helen Mirren as Sarah Winchester, uh, Sarah Snook as her niece, uh, Marion, 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 uh, and then her grand nephew, uh, Henry. I'm not even going to try to say the actor's name because it's the, one of the weirdest names I've ever seen, but, uh, the first name is Finn. I'll just say that. Um, and then, you know, obviously the visitor in the, in the form of this doctor, um, 
so you, it provides us with that groundwork so that you can see the potential for a better movie had it not been so generic. I'll get into why, you know, lazily generic in a minute, but that's pretty much my positive. Oh, and the cinematography is pretty sometimes. So, uh, you know, and I guess the performances are serviceable. There's really no actor that really, like, you know, separates himself from other actors. They're all uniformly solid-ish. I'll just say that. I, uh, I that's, actually... That's pretty much... I will agree with all your points. I mean, the cinematography is honestly kind of bland, but like you're right, some of the shots are actually well done and thought it, out. It, when it's when it's dark in the house is when I'm uh, and when and they're having to use like light sources. Yes, to, like to, lanterns yeah, that's and stuff. Much, yeah, that's pretty um, much what I was talking about. Because during the day, it just like it looks like a TV movie. It, yeah, it's, it, so. it it gets pretty um, TV sometimes, and that's one of the major issues. But uh, with the positives, you know. Uh, like Joel said, cinematography sometimes can surprise you. Um, the performances are serviceable. And the actual mythology of the story has a lot of great groundwork to work upon and become a good haunted house ghost story. Um, but I'll explain my negatives why that also works against itself for not adapting into something else. Um, but it does have a good foundation. And there are broad strokes like Joel mentioned. Like I actually liked the the guilt and the kind of backstory of Jason Clark's character. But the problem was that it happened so late in the movie that you just didn't care. And there was really yeah. no buildup. It just kind of like, it just kind of immediately happened. And you're like, I, okay. But I'm like, that character had a lot of stuff going on to where I was like, when the, when those moments happened, you know, I was like, that was good. Why couldn't most of the movie be like that? But whatever. Um, and I guess that's it. All right. So moving on to negatives. <laughs> Uh, it's very simple. Uh, one of my major issues with this movie is one, it is very lazy in the approaches it takes to jump scares and overall scares in general. It's the type of jump scares that are, uh, unearned, uh, unwarranted and very just uncreative. Um, it's just like a typical, like, you know, creepy face ghost movie and it kind of reminded me of like the makeup and friend request which is not a compliment because that movie is <laughs> atrocious um it, it it becomes like a generic lazy haunted house movie with uh like, like we said a very good foundation you can work upon my major issue with it uh, besides the laziness and not really the spirit brothers taking any sort of creative liberty with this um material i'm not saying you have to you know win oscars with this but at least make it decent um, is the actual mythology behind the Winchester? I, I get it. Uh, it's the mythology is built upon you know the people that were killed by the guns or you know coming back to haunt this woman. That sounds cool, as if it was like a like a campfire story or like a museum tidbit. But it does not work in a feature film. It sounds stupid. Like it sounds so dumb when they say it out loud. And like I said, I knew people were going to jump down my throat when I say this because that's what the actual story behind the mansion is. But that's the that's the problem is it's a story in real life. When you adapt it to the big screen in this fictional world, you have to change some things. And it just sounded so dumb when Helen Mirren or whoever was just like, you know, you know, it's all the ghosts in the house you were killed by, you know, the guns that my name is on. It's just like, it sounds so idiotic. And you don't care about anything. Everything uh, has like this sluggish pace to it to where like you just want it to kind of end. You don't really, really have that much investment of what's going on. The whole Jason Clark thing takes forever to get to. And even when, you know, they drop some emotional you know, knowledge on your ass, you just don't care because they wait so long until the very end of the movie to where anything significant happens with the characters and what they're going through to where you're like, I wasted an hour and a half because uh, I just ultimately didn't care. It was a repetitive movie to where it was like yeah. scares at night and, the, and then during the day, I said this uh, to my girlfriend because we watched it together. This is how the movie was. All right, uh, nighttime. Nighttime. Uh, someone has a lantern. They're going throughout the house. Uh, jump scare. Uh, cut to day scene. Jason Clark sitting uh, uh, like a therapist. So, uh, Helen Mirren, did you, um, have you seen any ghosts? No, I haven't seen any ghosts. Cut to night. All right, spooky house. Like, oh, the door creak. Jump scare. All right, daytime. Uh, Helen Mirren's character. Uh, uh, did, you, did you see any ghosts last night? Nope. 
All right, uh, nighttime. It like it's literally repetitive like that, and I'm just like, this is the type of material that the Spirit Bros took and stretched it out to an ungodly length that it just it felt unnecessary. And yeah. I know that these guys are creative. I know Joel thinks differently, but Jigsaw is like superior to this because they actually took something, they made it different. And they had some unique vision. I, I I haven't seen Jigsaw, so I can't. I can't. Oh, whoops. Uh, anyways, uh, well, I, I just <laughs> like like we even when you watch like Predestination or Daybreakers, they are the type of filmmakers that can ha- have some creative vision. But this just seems like they were. It was almost like they were sleepwalking. And I was like, yeah. this is not the Spirit Brothers that I like. I don't know what was up with. It's like they were an autopilot, and it, it kind of frustrated so- me. So to get it, so that's basically your negatives is kind of follow through. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> pretty, pretty much it. Yeah. So here, they're they're mine as well, and I'll and I'll, I gotta um, be quick about this, but I, I'll pretty much put it the way that I put it in my review. It's um, it's fairly simple, I, honestly. Like, imagine there's like this anthology series on you know maybe History Channel or um, uh, or something where it's like true horror stories come to life or whatever. There's a great 45 minute episode of that in this movie, but they stretch it out to 99 minutes, and it's way too long. It feels much, much longer than it is. Uh, and you're right. I mean, it's it's all about the follow through. So, you know, we have this great house that's uh, very big and grand, and it has a lot of grandeur, and we only see maybe 10 rooms in it. Um, and so the follow the follow through is kind of it's it's reduced to this handful of rooms where. Uh, you know, those are the only one. Those those are the only important ones where anything happens. Where we could have maybe a longer movie that takes place in you know more of the rooms. We get to see more of the house. That is entirely possible to do. Because um, you know, some moving. of the, some of the cinematography made the production design look cheap, like a like a reenactment on a TV show. Yeah, and I think it's because they're using such a small set. Yeah, and, prob- and probably you know the house was obviously a miniature that they're you know filming from above and all that. But. Um, in any case, so you have that, and there's there's no follow through there. Then you have the ghost, and for me, it becomes way too literal at the end. There's there's too much placed upon the climax being uh, this thing where it becomes the literal threat, and I do mean literal. I think Chase knows what I'm talking about, involving uh, magic bullet. Yes, Just say that. Yeah, that's well, once dumb. again that, that was, was dumb as well. That was the <laughs> dumbest thing. That's like it if somebody's so looking looking to this to be like some, you know, big work of trashy art or whatever, that's the only scene where you might say that that's <laughs> uh, you know, good trash. Uh it's the silliest thing I've ever seen. Um and you know, so it kind of is reduced to this, you know, like generic boogeyman threat uh by the end and there's you know, a bunch of special effects, bad special effects too at the end. And anyway, just, it just, it just ends up being not very compelling. And then you have the personal drama, which I think the movie sets up well in the first act. You know, you have the Jason Clark character being a laudanum, uh, addict. Uh, he is, he has a very tragic past, actually kind of a horrifying past, uh, to be completely honest. But it's like they forget uh, about it in the middle of the movie. But then you you right you they forget about it in the middle of the movie, and then the, by by the time they bring it up again, they turn it into this like hokey melodrama, uh, you know, feel for a hokey melodrama, and it just doesn't feel genuine at all. It doesn't feel like the movie's actually trying to confront it. It just feels like it's trying to come to a conclusion, and it does that by making that into another kind of very physical confrontation, and it doesn't work. It doesn't so earn you, it. Like it it's doesn't supposed to be a powerful it, yeah. moment, but the movie doesn't earn that moment. Yeah, it just it just comes across as weepy, and it's yeah. not or as soapy. You know, it just it's like a soap opera uh, all of a sudden, and it doesn't work because it's so sudden. It's such a it's such a sh- it's such a such a sudden shift. There we yeah. go. That's a say that phrase five five times fast. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's all about the follow through here. So to kind of wrap up, I, I I feel like the movie starts out well. It places uh, the pieces for an effective haunted house movie, you know, something along the lines of the others, yeah, um, or whatever. But it ends up just being the others' light. It's not. <laughs> it's it's not uh, uh, the other others. Maybe I don't know. Um, <laughs> the other uh, others. The extra. The extra others. The I, extra I don't know. Others. 
<laughs> I'm trying to turn that into something clever. Um, but yeah, it it just kind of flubs the follow through. It becomes very much a generic, um, you know, just a, just your typical horror movie. I don't think it's a terrible movie. I think that you know you could do worse than than something yeah. like this. Firm request. But, yeah, <laughs> apparently I didn't see it, but uh, I know I know that that's your favorite movie. Uh, so. <sighs> Anyway, I, I, I don't like it, but, you know, it's just kind of more of a waste of time. I mean, I was, about, of, I was about to wrap up. Maybe a waste of potential. Yeah, yeah. so my, my grade is a C-. minus. I, I don't know. It's I, just – Mine's actually the same grade, and I, I'm just going <laughs> to wrap up my overall thoughts with this. You know how I just told you, like, I hate using the L word because it's, like, an offensive word for a movie lazy? This is also an offensive word for a movie, and I'd rather you be awful – great good whatever but if you are forgettable that's even worse right. because it's almost like you wasted an hour and a half you walk out of the theater going i don't remember any of that and like, literally it, the, the reason that this is not i'm, I'm actually bringing my um uh, at least for the purposes of the website i'm bringing back uh, bottom tens and the rate and the reason that this won't be in contention for that is because i'm not going to remember it exactly like, uh, it's by, by the time by the time I'm going to be uh, posting my bottom tens uh, now, starting on December first of each year, so that I book book in December with best and worst, uh, or worst and best, I should say. And by December, I'm going to be like looking back at my releases, and I'm going to see. I'm going to predict this now. I'm going to see Winchester and be like, "Oh wow, I saw and reviewed that. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we we uh, actually like, made I, a whole show around we, that we one made a movie. whole show. <laughs> we made a whole show where we talked the entirety of our Winchester dis- of, of our Winchester discussion was 22 minutes long of the episode um, because there's not much to talk about. Yeah, like this- it's just it's just so like generic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just there. It just oh. plays on the screen and it doesn't interact with you at all. Exactly. It's- and one last thing, and we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up because I know Joel's got to go. This, if you put Helen Mirren on your poster, I expect her to be the main character. She is a supporting character at best. It is Jason Clark's yeah. movie, by the way. Sarah Snook has a, has yeah, much- she has a bigger role. <laughs> yeah, she has a bigger role. Uh, it's it's uh it's just it's a generic movie. So C minus for both of us. Let us know if you are also in the C minus range because I suspect that there's going to be a lot of people who are maybe even lower because it's it's getting uh pretty torn apart by critics right now. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So let us know what you think if you if you see this. Uh. We're obviously not recommending that you do. So. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> whatever. If you see it and immediately forget all of it, don't say that we didn't warn you. Exactly. Um, yeah, because it's one of those movies. So Well, yeah, just let us know down below what you think of Winchester, or as IMDb calls it, the Winchester Ghost Built House, whatever. Which, um, uh, <laughs> which is sh- funny because the the whole subtitle thing where it doesn't show up on the screen, so it's really irrelevant. But the fact that, you know, at one point it was being, um, like, uh, you know, advertised as that, it's not even the phrase that they use in the movie. No, The house that Ghost all. Built. They, they, they use another word for ghosts. So it's really it's funny. Just- I guess they, like, kind of caught on to that and they're like oh well okay this is why i hate the miscommunication between marketing and movies all right so yeah. uh yeah so t- l- let us know what you think of winchester if you got like super drunk or high and you saw it we don't condone that by the way but if you do uh and you let us know about your experience please let us know all right so that is the end of this episode episode 216 real quick joel before we plug in uh, all of our social meds and media uh what is next week for episode 217 yeah, next week kind of gets uh, started on a big, like, strong um, – a bunch of really big episodes are coming up, like, just generally speaking because of the releases. And next week, our main review is going to be the 1517 to Paris, which is the new Clint Eastwood uh, recent historical event movie. And then uh, I'm going to be offering an extra review of everyone's most anticipated movie of all time ever. It's Peter Rabbit. I'm going to be actually seeing that uh, next week. So I will I will tell you all how – how it is. And I will tell you about my experience of taking Joel to the insane asylum afterwards. All right. So uh, <laughs> that is next week for 217. And of course, the next week, you guys know what's going down Black Panther weekend. Uh, and then, of course, after that, also excited for Annihilation. Uh, so this whole, the whole rest of the month, I'm actually looking forward to even, yes, the train movie. Uh, so, yes, uh, that is this week's episode and next week. So I um, hope you guys have a good Super Bowl uh, Sunday tomorrow. Uh, if you're listening to this after Sunday, you know what I meant. Uh, so, anyway, uh, Joel, where can the uh, <laughs> lovely listeners find you online? Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter at Real Joel Copeland. That's R E E L, uh, much like my esteemed co-host. And then, um, 
uh, on Letterbox at Jay Copeling. You can find some of my writing, particularly this weekend, at DallasMovieScreenings.com and also at my website, JoelOnFilm.com. In addition to uh, Winchester, I also reviewed Bilal, Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool, and The Insult. And you can find all of those at either Dallas Movie Screenings or Joel on Film. Exactly. And uh, Twitter, at Real Chase Lee. Subscribe to my YouTube channel where you can see reviews. Uh, kind of like with Joel's uh, website, you can see my review for Bilal and Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool uh, if you want extra content. And of course, for this show, please spread it around, like, favorite, subscribe, share it, and let people know this is the Definitive Movie Podcast because, hey, if you listen to this entire movie podcast and you're not a movie fan, well, hopefully we convince you to be one. We'll see you guys next week for episode 217 where we talk about Clint Eastwood directing real-life people uh, in the real-life situation that they actually went through. So that will be also interesting. We'll see you guys next week. We're going to play the outro music right now. And uh, that in the intro is done by my friends, band Fervent Rose. All the links in the description below. Peace out, everyone. Have a good week, weekend, whenever you're listening to this. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Joel, I got it.